<laughs> I do well, good this. evening, folks. Hey, eh? seven o'clock in Queensland. It's eight o'clock in New South Wales, where our guest is coming from tonight. And it's, of course, nine o'clock in the UK, where my associate host um, is um, just below me. So, um, without further ado, um, I'll pass on to Andrina, and she can introduce our guest. Hi everybody, good morning, good welcome, good day and wherever you are in the world or if you're listening to a replay, welcome to Dream in the New Dream. Today it's the 8th of December, the, the days are going by a bit fast to the seaward. <laughs> um, it's a number 8 day today for those of you who are into the numbers, so it's a good day today and um, being actually on an 8th, so uh, double 8 today. Um, it's my our great pleasure to welcome Sol Romana Clark onto the show, who's the producer of Hemp Solution. And I, reading through your bio, you're um, a man of many talents, um, playing the ditch, different instruments, making jewellery, um, retreats, um, breath or breath work, and all sorts of things. So I would love you to start your journey of life where you started in the world and how all the steps that have brought you to this moment now so welcome <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well I, I did i did that's a big question isn't it i mean i, I should I, I could write an autobiography <laughs> you can I did go actually, wherever um, you like <laughs> Okay, well, I was um, I was dumped at Mel at a hospital in Melbourne by my Canadian birth mother, who then pissed off, and uh, I was adopted to a happy family uh, in Melbourne, raised in Sydney. I went to a private school. I I've ha had a very um, uh, wealthy upbringing, but then I abandoned all that at the age of eighteen and joined a cult called the Moonies. Uh, that <laughs> oh, me to did you really? City, right? Yeah. And spent years um, in the Moonies and sang in a choir. Then I um, dro dropped out of that and went to Queen's College and studied. Um, I, I was very concerned about politics at the time and the wars in Central America and so on. Uh, and initially I got interested in that because I, I was anti-communist being in the Moonies, but then I went to uh, New York University and got a degree in political science and ended that degree down in Costa Rica and came back completely radicalized and um, started working to expose all the corruption of what the US <laughs> government and Reagan and Bush were up to with their um, drug smuggling and aiding the Contras against Nicaragua and blah, blah. Uh, then I started working on documentary films in LA and worked on the uh, a couple of documentary films, one called Cover Up Behind the Iran Contra Affair and another mm -hmm. one called Panama Deception that, that won, an, won an Oscar. I, I was just a, a researcher and editor as part of a team on those docos. And then I wanted to start a doco called Drugs and Deception because I was very concerned with the war on drugs and the way that governments and like agencies like the CIA and others were, were actually using the war on drugs for their own ends. And, um, yeah, how, how the war on drugs was also... Um, the drug, you know, drugs and illegal drugs were a weapon of geopolitical power. So, so I wanted to expose all that, but then I got a few um, death threats, so I stopped doing that. <laughs> and then I um, read, read a book by Jack Herrera called The Emperor Wears No Clothes, and I thought, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I could include a little bit of a critique on the drug war by, by um, you know, d doing a documentary on cannabis and also at the same time um, to show all the wonderful things that the cannabis plant can do because it's not not only an issue of, of marijuana and cannabis medicine but as as we're going to talk about um, it's an amazing plant and it's been unfairly repressed mm -hmm. so I started that in 1991 and so oh, I made yeah. that and then um, released it as a film in 95 and it went to 100 cities on 16 millimeter film around the world. Uh, and then it did a DVD release. And then I did a, a couple of updates, one in uh, 2010. And the last update I did was 2016. So um, it's, it's e e even that long ago is, um, what's that, 
four, six years ago. There's mm. a lot has happened in the last six years. So to do this radio interview, I've had to do like a week of study to catch myself up. To <laughs> 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 the, um, you're very lucky. You're thinking, um, Tom you know, someone's got to do it. I didn't. I didn't. I started this in 1991. I didn't expect to be like an ongoing authority on the cannabis hemp plant, but <laughs> I keep getting called. I I did a um I did a lecture recently at the the Rumor Rotary Club for the Rotarians about cannabis hemp medicine and did one for the Bermagui, um local university in our local town. So I, I, I keep... And then uh, at, at Nimbin, they asked me to do... I, I went to the Nimbin Mardi Gras, which is Australia's um, sort of leading epicenter. town in the <laughs> epicentre of, of countering the, uh, the laws against cannabis and trying to, you know, you know the... the uh, the, the uh, yeah the, the the nexus of the the, the, the cannabis movement the, the legalized <laughs> cannabis movement anyway they asked me to do a a, a ceremony um, uh, last Mardi Gras so I, I actually led a did a bit of civil disobedience and led a group of <laughs> 120 people in, in a cannabis medicine meditation ceremony <laughs> so, wow that so must have been I, amazing <laughs> I seem to have I seem to just have keep getting called to do to to um be an ally and a supporter of the cannabis plant which is a quite quite a blessing really i'm, I'm quite happy quite happy to do the job because it's a wonderful plant and i'm all for it so uh, you, a, a couple of things i've done <laughs> anyway i, I, I if, don't know about cannabis and the plant my story I, I also had a shop in central tilba where i promoted hemp clothes and made jewelry and I uh, promoted my DVD and um, other things in, in a little country town on the far south coast of New South Wales. So I did that for 28 years. And then the last um, four years, I've been retired from that and been focusing on on a retreat center in the bush um, that got burnt down. I've had to rebuild, rebuild it. So I've been out in the bush rebuilding a retreat center for most of the last three years since the bushfires. So there you go. There's my whole life story. Right. <laughs> So for those people that don't know much about cannabis and the benefits and, you know, there's obviously all sorts of wacky stories and shouldn't be taking it and all of these. Can you enlighten um, for some people all about it and what it does and the benefits? Well, hang on a sec. I've got a five minute video of, of um, Souls. Shall we play that? Yeah, yeah. Is that five minutes? Because well, that's yeah. a five minute trailer. Okay. I think that'll... Yeah, yeah go I think that's going to be a, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, going to be quite um, empowering, isn't it? Okay. Um, just a moment. When I um, it's got music soundtrack. I don't know if I've actually gone and set it up. I'll just see if it does play. <laughs> you have to tell me if you get the audio because I'll have to go and reset it. Did you get the oh, audio? Oh no, no. Okay, I know what to do. Um, you carry on talking and I'll set it up. I need to go back in and connect it to um, put the audio to it. Um, just two six. Oh, present. Uh, by the way, I met um, Sol and um, Chuck the, down at the. Um, there we go. Shanti. Shanti yeah, at the. Um, Nimbin um, event. Mardi Gras. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's go with this. Oh. Okay. Let's start again. For as long as we can look back, it's thrown in its lot with us. Marijuana has been associated with human camps as far back into the Paleolithic ages we can look. And there are a few plants in the world that have been as useful to human beings. But in modern times, to merely be in the presence of this plant can be a criminal offence. Millions have been and continue to be arrested. <laughs> Him 
Hemp has been the major paper making material for most of the time since paper was discovered in China around the time of Christ. The world consumes hundreds of thousands of tons of paper each year. And to meet this demand, hundreds of thousands of acres of forest are cut down each year. It's a worldwide crisis. There's no need to be flattening these forests. We could be doing it with, other, with alternative fibres. Hemp and uh, Kanaf are just two of them. The textile industry is also experiencing a resurgence of interest in hemp. Chinese hemp will go from being 10% to 20% the size of their cotton crop. There are good reasons for this. The cotton industry is basically a chemical industry. Unlike cotton, uh, hemp can be grown entirely without uh, pesticides or insecticides. An acre of hemp grown at a sewage treatment plant could soak up 10 million litres of effluent and at the same time produce 18 tonnes of valuable hemp fibre. The English recently completed the world's largest hemp building, the 4,500 square metre Adnams Brewery. While growing, this hectare of hemp would have absorbed 18 tonnes of carbon dioxide which becomes locked into the walls of the Hempcrete house. BMW and Mercedes-Benz are using hemp in components. We envision hemp as being a complete new wave of the Industrial Revolution. Hemp seeds contain up to 40% high quality oil. Many great paintings are hemp oil on hemp canvas. It is a nutritious space for cosmetics and is also a highly nutritious edible oil. Dr. Udo Erasmus states that hemp oil contains the best balance and quality of essential and beneficial fatty acids of all the seed oils. It has a near complete balance of essential amino acids. Hemp is probably the world's most economical, ecological and easy way to grow highly nutritious protein food. Now that's something to shout about. <laughs> the hemp plant has been most commonly associated with the drug cannabis, now commonly called marijuana, found in its flowers and leaves. The father of Chinese medicine, Emperor Shen Nung, included marijuana in his pharmacopoeia almost 5,000 years ago. Now the modern use of it <laughs> are quite striking. It was actually the United States government that discovered marijuana's most significant medical use. They found that marijuana slowed the growth of three kinds of cancers in mice. This resin is the medicine. When collected and processed properly, the resulting oil is an effective cure or control for practically any disease known to man, even cancer. We have supplied this oil to dozens of people with cancer. This is a miracle medicine. There's no way around that. I got nothing else to say, but, you know, it, it's good. It's, it does the trick. It works. But marijuana remains one of the most illegal substances on the planet. <laughs> Approximately 20% of criminal convictions are marijuana related. When the wind is singing of freedom, when the stone begins to turn. I inhaled uh, frequently. That was, uh, that, was, that was the point. It does carry a fantasy inducing, thought catalyzing quality that allows the mind to rove and scan. Under the influence of the drug, he killed his entire family with an axe. The hemp prohibition was initiated by American petrochemical companies in the 1930s to destroy the economic potential of hemp. It's a blatant case of industrial espionage to remove competition. Hemp is making a rapid comeback to service at a critical time with huge potential benefits. Mm. There you go. I think that really uh, is a quite good five-minute trailer just to um, awaken people's consciousness. Isn't it? Mm. So, do you are you yeah. finding more and more people are going that way now? You know, with all the different things that are going on, that they're they're getting more into the hemp and the natural ways. Um... Well, yes, yeah, certainly since since ninety one when I first began this project, there's been a, a huge um, yeah, increase in consciousness of people realizing that, that yeah we need need to 
work in harmony with Mother Earth or else <laughs> it, we ain't going to survive as a species. So the, I think there is generally a lot of people um, who are looking at labels and seeing what fibres they're wearing, seeing if, if they're organic. Hemp, hemp is certainly um, grown an, enormously uh, in, in popularity. Um, I, I, I see now that there's some people doing organic cotton, but um, mm. I, I do know for sure that it's a lot easier to grow hemp organically than it is to grow cotton organically. So the, um, yeah, the, the question then is why aren't we growing more hemp yeah. um, instead of cotton? And, and that is still a big unanswered question because um, the Chinese have proven, pardon me, the Chinese have proven that you can grow hemp very profitably and, and very easily. And um, yeah, with, with, with less, cer certainly less um, pesticides and fertilizers than, than cotton. So, so it's, it, it's a no brainer really, which, but there's, there's an inertia in existing industries and existing industries like to keep defending themselves and fight, you know, fight, fight hard to, to not rock the boat too much. But um, unfortunately, it took a, it took a, uh, an, an authoritarian, you know, communist government in China to, to say, no, we're going to shift over to, to hemp, certainly for, for a, a portion of their fiber industry. And uh, they're very successful at it. Um, and yeah, the only country that's what... really doing hemp fiber in, in a big way. There's, there's Europe also is, is um, uh, doing, doing quite a bit of hemp fiber now. And it's, it's, um, they, they, they're doing things like, like, like I mentioned, um, using the cellulose and hemp to make components for car bodies. Um, but in a limited way, it has, they could still be doing so much more because, um, hemp is 70% cellulose and it's the longest and strongest fiber in the plant kingdom. So Henry Ford showed, um, back in the thirties, I think that, um, you could make a make a car from use, using hemp, and it would be as, as strong as steel. And now the latest technology is that you can actually make, you know, um, beams out of hemp that are as strong as steel. So that technology is here with us. It just takes probably takes government subsidies and support, you know, to, to help private enterprise, you know, make the shift because it it it's 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 costly setting up a whole industry that's that's going to manufacture on on, on that scale takes support and at, at the moment um just looking at australia there's so many restrictions on farmers growing hemp you, you know you have to get a get permission you have to get the right seeds you have the regulators come to make sure that the hemp that, that the thc level in the hemp isn't too high if it's too high, they'll come and destroy your crop. Um, you know, but it, even in spite of that, there are there are quite a number of successful hemp farmers in Australia growing for fiber and for food, and then some for medicine. But that, that's mm. another story. But um, yeah, we are we, we we have so much more potential than yeah. than um, we're allowing ourselves. And, and Canada is just a case in point because in Canada they've they've legalized all aspects of the cannabis plant, including the marijuana and the, the medicine. And their, their farmers can now grow fiber and medicine or seeds and medicine in the same crop. It becomes extremely profitable and, and there's not all the policing and the licensing and the restrictions. And their, their um, cannabis hemp crop is now, now worth a billion dollars and rising rapidly. Um, in Australia, by contrast, the Australian government under the, um, I think it's, it's called Agri-Futures, which is an Australian government agency that's commissioned to support agriculture in Australia. They are 100% supportive of hemp, but their goal is that hemp production will, will get up to like $20 million worth in by 2026. That's the Agri Futures, an Australian government agency, that is minuscule compared to what you know. Canada's already a billion dollars. Um, China, we don't know. China's pro probably, you know, around that 
that um, or more. But China is also restricted in, the, in that they're only allowing it to, under under very strict control with no um, ability for farmers to procure the medicine from the hemp hemp crop. It, it It's a complex issue because the plant is so amazing, it can provide uh, food and fiber, as we've already mentioned, and medicine. And all strains of the cannabis hemp plant can provide all three, but there are strains that are that you know that, that that are bred for medicine and strains best for fiber and other strains best for food. But if you grow industrial hemp, it was discovered only recently after I you know I, I already knew that the, the cannabis hemp was an was an amazing plant when I began this project in 1991. But sometime during the 90s and then towards the late 90s, it became, it was discovered that mm -hmm. even the industrial hemp crop is high in, in a cannabinoid called CBD, which is a very valuable medicine. And now there is a huge interest and in, in market and, and, and realization that, that CBD, even from industrial hemp, is an extremely valuable medicine. So that makes it a a, a doubly good crop for farmers. They could spe specialize in growing it for seed and or specializing it, you know, grow specialized strains for fiber. But on top of that, still be able to sell the um, procure a really valuable medicine. So it's an extremely valuable crop if we could just drop the legal restrictions. And, and Canada is the example of that right now. So we're wasting a huge opportunity in, yeah. in Australia and most countries in the world are wasting a huge opportunity by being so so caught up in, in fear around it. And so pragmatic. Hey, um, Cole, so what I was really interested in one of your um, video clips that I watched was the uh, ratio of um, one hectare, one yeah. hectare takes 14 weeks and from that you can have one house. And you compare yeah. that with... Um, growing, um, say, ponderosa pine or radiator pine, which requires its own temperate climate and pH soil and all that stuff. And honestly, you know, you could be 10, 12 years before you get something of any building quality. Uh, and yeah. even then per hectare, this, this hemp, we, I saw where those guys in Holland there had that tractor, which had the uh, cutting thing went down like that, and they just went and just cut right down towards the, yeah. um, just above the root level there and so you had a stubble and so it was like sugar cane so you, you actually it's retained like, the soil yeah, like very yeah. Nice sugar cane, yeah yeah so you retained the, the soil because um any a lot of these crops here you get put up like that and the next season become a dust bowl so i, I saw yeah. that and i thought oh my god you've now got a, a stubble there that's going to obviously regrow and the other thing is it's such a tall plant uh, uh, no, it doesn't. Doesn't really grow. You need to plow, plow that in. The stubble doesn't. It, it, it's it's only right. an annual plant, but right. the stubble does provide um, fertilizer for the okay. soil and it stabilizes the the soil. So it's 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 very good at stopping soil erosion, and in grown in rotation with other crops, it's also very beneficial to you know to provide nutrients to the soil and suppress weeds. Yeah, because so that's the other thing, because yeah. it's such a tall plant, isn't it? So it's not as if yeah. it's going to be like a tree and it's going to be, needs to be pruned and trimmed and that. Um, it's, it's almost like a triffids, isn't it? Triffids just going straight up. And um, what I liked about that is um, you had a film clip in, um, in the pool there where the um, it could actually be used in, as firewood. I mean, it just keeps on giving, doesn't <laughs> yeah. it? As a fuel. Yeah. yeah. It does, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, this is. Um, I know we talk about. Uh, I'm wearing a about vest of, of the... Oh yeah, go, go, go. Mm -hmm. go. Oh, I was just saying this is, this is from Nepal. This this vest where they, they hand, hand make the, the fiber. They pull the, pull the outside fibers off the stalk, and I when I went over there, I saw them, yeah, doing that and then then uh, spinning it, in, in into thread and then using a loom, a hand loom to make. So they, yeah, that's their traditional way of making garments. Probably one of the oldest, oldest, you know, garments on the planet. 
going going back thousands of years. So so this is this vest you can still still buy hemp made that way that's been made for thousands of years. But yeah, obviously with modern technology like what the Chinese are doing, which is what this this shirt is, it it, it can be very you know made very fine, blended with cotton or other fibers, blended with silk. Um, there's all sorts of yeah advanced technology of processing mainly done by the Chinese these days, which which makes hemp a superior fabric to almost any fabric. Like, like, like I, I, I've been wearing hemp for uh, 30 years now since it became available, and my hemp clothes way outlast um, cotton or, or bamboo. Bamboo's been a popular fibre recent years, but my, my bamboo jeans um, wear out way faster than, than the hemp ones. So <laughs> it's definitely... Def definitely the most superior um fiber i've ever worn i've tried it tried them all so and it's obviously breathable <laughs> too isn't it yeah very breathable very breathable. comfortable yeah very comfortable to wear yeah yeah um yeah and having said that it it's probably most comfortable blended with a bit of cotton which is what what this shirt is i'm wearing it's and the t-shirt is 55 percent hemp 45 percent cotton uh, but having said that, I've got shirts that are 100% hemp. Um, they get a bit crinkly when you wash them. You're probably best to iron them, otherwise they crinkle up. But, but um, yeah, if you if you if if you wear 100% hemp jeans or a hemp shirt, that has a beautiful feel to it. It really holds its shape nicely and breathes really well. It's a yeah, it's it, it, it's like a a really high top quality linen, you know, in that sense. But yeah, very nice fabric too. So tell me something, because um, my mate and I, we got a mobile home and we went out to Ninda Gully, which is a good seven hour drive west of um, Brisbane here. And we we're going through all the uh, wheat fields and the cotton fields. And they've had a lot of floods in that part of the world. And a lot of the wheat fields were completely um, damaged, but beyond control or just basically downscaled to uh, feed fodder. But um, how good then is um, hemp? In a situation out there in the Darling Downs, when you get the floodwaters, can it um, rejuvenate and come back after being in the water for a week or so? Oh, look, I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm not really an agronomist to know. I know it's a very sturdy plant, and it 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 grows in a huge range of environments, from cold down in Tassie, where most of our Australian hemp is grown now, all the way up to Queensland um, and to central. I'm actually buying some hemp uh, that's been grown in Tamworth uh, to make hemp creek out of. I'm going to build a, a hempel, a hemp temple on, on our <laughs> block. So I'm just about to buy buy some hemp from out there where it's very hot. You know, it grows in the summertime in, in Tamworth. So it has a huge versatility. And because of its strong tap root uh, and because it's the strength of the actual plant itself, I imagine it would be as good as any other crop at surviving a flood but yeah i, I wouldn't, wouldn't know for sure but it it is very a very strong robust and versatile crop and and the the gene pool is very diverse so you can you can you can you can get strains that grow in a very wide variety of different conditions and environments depending on where you want to grow it and what yeah, because up you there want to in the on the Darling Downs, you either get the red soil or the black soil. So, I mean, mm. we met some people who told us about these out-of-towners who come to Moree to build their artesian hot pools, and they built it on black mm. soil, and it didn't take long before the um, the pools cracked because of the the porous nature of black soil, which turns into, well, you can get get your machinery stuck in it, no problem at all. It's almost like a quicksand right. type product. Um but if it's going to be in Tasmania, obviously the cold and um, they get a lot of icy um, uh, mornings and so forth. So it's, it's even yeah, no, definitely to frost it's versatile. Yeah. Well, it was it was originally indigenous to the Himalayas. In in, in fact, um, there's there's a Vedic text uh, from the from the Indian sacred scriptures saying Lord Shiva brought cannabis from the himalayas for human enjoyment and enlightenment that's in the in this the ancient hindu scriptures um so i think it originally came from from there although there's also 
evidence of ancient usage in Africa and the Middle East as well. So, um, yeah, there's a wide range of climates just in those three places where ancient hemp came from. And so some of those hemp strains were primarily used for fiber and some for, for medicine. But, um, yeah, it's basically the same plant called cannabis sativa, just different strains of the same plant. Mm. so um do they have the the guys in canada i mean america there i was up in uh, colorado there a couple of years ago and of course that's all opened up and um off you go and you get your um cannabis um medicines there and and denver and there's a lot of states that were very poor that opened up to hemp and um cannabis situations and their tax um the state's tax coffers have benefited substantially as a result of opening up to um, putting cannabis out there like you go into the Netherlands, isn't it? <clears throat> yes. Yes. Um, I think about half the states have, have, have legalised um, either marijuana or or either T THC, the psychoactive cannabis, or the medicinal cannabis, which... Or, we, 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 which includes THC and CBD. Some states have legalized CBD and THC. Some have legalized um, just CBD and some have kept it all illegal. So it's a bit of a mixture over in the states. But, but yeah, the ones, that, the ones that have legalized everything, like Colorado and California and Seattle and Oregon, um, yeah, they, the cannabis industry there is, is really booming and mm -hmm. they haven't experienced adverse you know, side effects of kids getting overly, um, you know, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> I don't think it's made matters worse, put it that way. <laughs> I'm sure there's still kids kids who are more interested in getting stoned than going to school, probably before <laughs> prohibition or after prohibition. <laughs> but certainly, certainly dropping prohibition hasn't made matters worse, for sure. And um, I don't think there's been, I, I, I think if anything, it's, it's, it's improved matters based on the latest research that that's happened in California and Colorado. Um, that includes, you know, road accidents and it even, it, it also includes statistics relating to addiction of harder drugs. So when cannabis is, you know, as Andrew Weil, Dr. Andrew Weil, who's a very notable doctor in, in uh, the United States, as he, as he says in my documentary, the, the desire to the human's desire to alter consciousness is a very fundamental part of, of humans. Humans have always wanted to do that. And the for that reason, the drug plants are the oldest known cultivated plants by humans. So um, the, it's, the, the question is, how are we going to deal with that natural desire in a safe and healthy way? And that requires wisdom and education and and the, the you, you know the biggest way that we can deal deal with the situation is is, is through education through our maturity as mm -hmm. individuals and as a society so that is happening i'm happy to say in in my lifetime there's been a huge growth of awareness and understanding and um if we're talking about colorado they they are um way ahead of the whole world on that level they just voted uh in the midterm elections to legalize not only cannabis but also um all natural plant psychoactive medicines including uh, mescaline based cactuses with mescaline in and psilocybin mushrooms and um ayahuasca that can, contains dmt as long as it's all from natural plants so that is an amazing step wow. for an advanced <laughs> Western state, and guess what the vote was? What do you think the vote was? Like forty-nine percent to fifty-one. What do you reckon? 80. It was ninety-one percent. Yes. Wow. Ninety-one. <laughs> In fact, it was over. It was nearly ninety-two percent of the population voted. So I think that's where we're going, and it's 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 nothing to be afraid of or scared of, because 
thank heavens for the rest of us, Colorado has set an, an example to show the rest mm. of the world that we don't have to be afraid of plants. <laughs> we don't have to be afraid of Mother Nature. We just have to learn how to work in harmony with them. And mm. if we work in harmony with nature, she will give us everything we need. We don't have to worry. It's only fear and greed and, and our limited mm. thinking that is actually holding us back. In, in, mm. You know, cannabis sativa is, is just a wonderful example of a plant that can provide so many things. If we can just drop our fear, and instead of putting all our energy into the fear and repression of it, put our energy into learning about it, learning how to live in harmony with it, as we as many other cultures have for thousands of years before our culture. Prohibition of cannabis only, only started in, in, I think, 1937. So mm. 6,000 years before then, there's a recorded history of us using and working with the plant as a species in a, a very harmonious way, mostly. There's, there's various um, historical instances, limited historical instances, instances of there being uh, limited prohibition. I think there was prohibition in in um, Egypt or Greece or something what, two thousand years ago. But very limited. Mostly, we've been able to live in harmony with plants. But the the thing about it is though that um, our our white European culture, of which I'm I'm from, um, has way less experience than other cultures with with the psychoactive plants, and the, there's always well for, for many years in, including the the repression of the so-called witches and all that there was active suppression of um those women and others who who were proponents of plant medicine and probably some psychoactive plant medicine as, as part of that and they were um wiped out of europe and the, 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 there's been very little experience you know as a result in the western civilization of working harmoniously with psychoactive plants apart from alcohol which doesn't really add up as a psychoactive plant <laughs> it's, it's, it's basically the only drug you know which has been allowed and tobacco and tobacco and alcohol pro pro probably the, the the most dangerous of them all um so anyway um we have much to learn and we are learning from other cultures at this point, how to work, you know, harmoniously with with psychoactive plants, and if we can get over that fear, then then cannabis has so much to offer offer us, and and industrial hemp will be freed way more easily if we could, you know, just drop that that immature fear of yeah yeah. One, that one thing called THC, one little mo molecule in some of the cannabis strains, not all of them, but only some of them. I, I mean, there's even paranoia about CBD right now, which is completely non-psychoactive, and yet farmers who grow industrial hemp are not able to procure CBD from their crop. And that there's, there's no, it makes no sense at all. Industrial hemp has to be below 1% THC, and industrial hemp... You know, had, had, that 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 is 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 nothing. There's no psychoactive effect of industrial hemp. It takes at least, you know, ten percent THC, ten to twenty percent THC to be to be called marijuana. So so our laws are um yeah very backward. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's hope because I have hope for human evolution. <laughs> Colorado is is proving the fact that uh, you know e even white us white cultures, you know, white civilization is 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 evolving and it's it's happening. Mm. There's only only um it's only so long that that silly laws can stay in place. So looking at the big picture, there's a lot of hope. We are evolving and mm. um I'm sure I'm sure there's a bright rosy future for for our you know for humanity to work in harmony with cannabis hemp in the future and, and it, it's happening j j just in the last 30 years there's been just an enormous uh growth of understanding of the plant and enormous growth of technology and some of the cutting edge tech technology is, is is very exciting things that i wouldn't have even dreamed of like right now that 
some of the latest research is showing that because the um, cannabis fiber is so high in cellulose and so, so long and strong, it ha has lots of um, uses, including um, a substitute for graphene uh, to make batteries. Mm -hmm. So what, the, what they're finding is they, if they get the bast fibers from cannabis hemp and they heat it up in an oven and, and uh, carbonize it, then it actually turns out to be a, a substance that, that is uh, superior to graphene, which is used in uh, big industrial batteries. Um, and then the question is, well, does that, could that then apply to, to regular batteries, um, you know, like our lithium, lithium ion batteries? Mm -hmm. So there's, there is research. The, the, the problem now is, now is that it's, it, it's a bit too bulky but it certainly can, can be used for industrial batteries or if we, you know, had, had a, a solar farm and needed to store, store, you know, large, large amounts of electricity and size volume wasn't an issue, then, then hemp batteries with the latest research look, look very promising mm. as, as, uh, and then like, like I said before, the latest research of, of using hemp to, to make, um, uh, structural beams, you know, for building, um, is uh, yeah, was, was, you know, is to, to make to make beams as as strong as as steel, the comparable weight. So anyway, there's lo lots of exciting technology um, out there, and then there's lots of research just into the value of uh, the hemp food, the hemp seed, mm. with with technology that's been analysing. The, the seed and, and the, the components in the seed, the, the value of the protein in the seed, it's probably, as, as a protein source, pr probably the second highest, second to soybean as the, as the um, yeah, high, high protein food source, but su way superior to, to soybean because it has all the, you know, full, full spectrum of the essential fatty acids, the omega-3, omega-6, Omega nine and two other ones as well that are that are also the one that's in the evening primrose or primrose oil. Or I forget the names of them, but this it, it ha has the, the fullest spectrum of the essential fatty acids of, of any of the seed or seed oils, and the protein is also in a form that's very easily digested. Mm. So I think it's superior. It's a superior form of plant protein of almost any other plant protein. The only challenge is to be really edible. You have to dehull it. It's a bit like you have to dehull walnuts and macadamia nuts and sunflower seeds. So it's a similar similar kind of challenge to to dehulling a um, or a pumpkin seed. Um, so it's yeah similar kind of challenge. You have to have to hull dehull it. But they've now got got um, dehulling machines and. Yeah, hemp, hemp seed would be a way superior, um, you know, alternative vegetarian protein to, to soybean. Way superior. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's it, it. I think it's inevitable that eventually hemp will be, you know, as, as popular or more so than soybean. It's it's kind of inevitable just based on the science. But there's a huge inertia, you know, in changing industries over and getting it growing and uh, like, like I say we have to let go of, of all, all the fears and restrictions around it too for that to happen I'm raving you know, on now and so, <laughs> and so you know we've had a lot of industries that have been destabilized and when we saw um, Excitopedia Britannia when um, Bill Gates when he was setting up his um, IBM compatible computers and um, he went to them and said oh look how can we bundled the Excitopedia Britannia into the um, Windows operating system and they turned them down. So he then set up World and Carter. Next second, there's no more Excitopedia Britannia. And of course, the same thing happened with the digitization of, of cameras. So you didn't have to go to the pharmacy and wait a week before you get your film produced. And then we've seen the likes of Uber come along and next second, they don't have a product. They just got an app that allows people to bloody book them. So surely we've seen a few things that have just creeping into the industries and destabilizing. I mean, in the old days, you know, 
local newspapers was the, the cut and thrust of getting the news out there. It's gone, you know. So and we've seen the, the, the birth of social media for um, getting your personal notices out there and looking for a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband or wife. I mean, it's just the, the paradox of yeah. of our whole generation is, is shifting. So yet yeah. I give it a lot yeah. of um, credit to the fact that there was a gentleman here in Australia called Peter Andrews who went on to show you how to um, take a property and make it drought proof. And um, unfortunately, his bank at the time, National Australia Bank, really forced him to the wall. He had some personal tragedy mm -hmm. there as well. But lucky, um, um, Jerry Harvey took him on board and he drought proofed his, his property. And then um, Jerry Harvey introduced him to Richard Pratt, the guy who does VisiBoard, and drought proofed his property. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. to his credit, um, Jerry Harvey then had to go and re educate members of the agricultural community both at university level and within the agricultural departments to show them how to stabilise the farm and get that um, drought-proof system in place. And there's some really simple techniques. And and, um, and I remember ABC doing the story on Peter Andrews and they took a helicopter across all these drought-affected properties and all of a sudden you come across some of these valleys there run by Richard Pratt and the green is green is green. And, you know, yeah. Sometimes you just have to go through that whole academia world to re-educate them. It's, I find yeah. it really frustrating that <laughs> our politicians are really people who have gone to universities and become lawyers and, and yeah. never really been like our founding farmers who've come from an industry and have an understanding of industry. The lawyer politicians just hand it back to the academic world and being an expert and then they've got all these little checkpoints. There's no intuition. There's no... Um, feeling about getting in touch with the uh, with nature itself and working with nature i, f I find it yeah i'm flabbergasted at the times mate <laughs> it's a challenge <laughs> i think that's a challenge for all of us who are waking up on this planet to uh look around and say what what planet <laughs> am i on <laughs> this is, this is, when it seems so obvious the way things could be doesn't it when <laughs> But I think we have to, um, I think we basically have to forgive our world, don't we? Otherwise, we're going to end up just being very angry and have righteous indignation and piss everybody off around us. <laughs> so I think we just have to um, keep holding the light of truth and um, just keep, keep, um, keep being that, keep, keep supporting all of us individually, wherever we find ourselves, supporting activities industries lifestyles that are sustainable healthy and in harmony with mother earth and in harmony with nature and that aren't ruled by fear so mm. wherever we find ourselves we just have to keep holding that space and i basically you know just find myself letting go of my worry and frustration otherwise it's going <laughs> to cause me too much too much anxiety and I'm not going to be able to help anyone if I'm all you know pissed off and anxious mm. I do I do keep hope alive in my own my own being because I do see a lot of positive things happening there is a lot of science and technology which is helping us you know teaching us things there's a lot of ancient wisdom from indigenous cultures that we are also you know realizing that we need to learn from there is also um an increase in people expanding their consciousness by breaking out of old thought systems you know like like um you know old <laughs> religious thought systems that have been around for thousands of years and realizing that yeah having having more expanded states of awareness um in their spirituality there's a whole you know in the last 30 years just been a huge explosion of of consciousness on the planet so i i can see lots of lots of positive things and one of those one you know coming full circle from from, from talking talk, you know talking from science and technology and indigenous 
influences is, is, is the plant kingdom itself teaching us through plant medicine. And I think that that's, that's something which um, I, I am very reverent about. Like I might go to church and, you know, thank Jesus or thank Buddha in a temp, but I'm also very reverent towards um, plant medicines. And I think that the, yeah, the way the plant kingdom is just subtly creeping in to human consciousness um, at this time with the assistance of ancient traditions, um, you know, from, from ancient cultures of India and Peru and um, others in, in South America and, and North America too. Um, yeah, the way that, that that ceremonial reverence of plant medicine is coming back into the Western culture is is quite amazing. I'm, I'm quite astounded to, to, yeah, to meet so many people who have had experiences with those um, ancient in, in a ceremonial context, with ancient um, traditions carried carried through into the modern world of using sacred medicines like ayahuasca or or San Pedro or peyote. Or cannabis in a in a reverent way to actually expand consciousness and not just get stoned and drop out. You know, it's, I I've personally found that that um, yeah, the plant kingdom can be very healing and particularly helpful in us reconnecting with nature and reconnecting with spirit and reconnecting with um, infinite consciousness. Getting our getting our, our our particular consciousness back in perspective, because mm. one, thing, one thing that Western society has done is, with our in, intellectual way of looking at things and our, our school system and our whole, you know, in, intellectual way, it's ma made us very disconnected. It's made us very much in our heads, and v very much thinking that we can solve everything just by thinking it out or or with our Technical, technological solutions and with our cities and our whole culture we've we've just basically become disconnected from nature and that's that's where i think there's 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 a there's a just a real need for humans and for our civilization just to get back in harmony with nature and connect with nature and that's where where plant medicines can help us enormously enormously as well as people just taking time to just connect with nature personally and to, to grow some vegetables in their garden or to walk in the forest and listen to the birds or go to a, a national park and yeah, just, just to get off their screens and get back into the forest. So I, I think more and more people are realizing the need for that. And the, the um, yeah, I, I trust nature ultimately. I think, think, those of us or, or the, the aspects of our civilization that refuse to will, you know, probably not be sustainable one way or another. God, God help, help us all. But um, I think the hope, the hope for our civilization is, is coming back into harmony with, with the plant kingdom. And um, yeah. <laughs> so I think there is, is a lot of hope. I see it, see the, the awakening happening and, and um yeah, I'm not quite sure how it's going to play out. So I'm not going to. <laughs> I think a lot of people, especially young people, I'm concerned of. I, I see a lot of young people very concerned. They hear all this fear, you know, about global warming and and about crises which are probably inevitably coming to our civilization if we don't clean up our act quickly. But um, on the other hand, I would j just want to remind those young people there is is enormous positive changes happening also and mm -hmm. the fear-based media are not necessarily broadcasting all those positive positive things that are happening and i think that the greatest fear is fear itself and i think if we if we allow it, it, it's almost like the way i look at life and the way the, i think what the plant medicines have taught me is that um being incarnated in a human body there's sort of um, all sorts of challenges and every challenge is an opportunity and we have two choices with everything we we can either see be a victim to it and respond with anger and 
pissed offness and fear, or we can see every every challenge as an opportunity, every crisis as an opportunity for growth. And I think on a on a global scale, on a, on a civilization scale, we have a civilization which is faced with enormous crises and almost to the point where we can look down the the road and see that we might be headed for for major crises coming up and yet in those circumstances is a little bit like like an embryo going down the birth canal you know we're getting squeezed and you know we could, the whole civilization could could be just destruct you know going through that birth canal but i think i think on a on a on a on a civilization scale we are birthing and it's a huge huge task <laughs> and mm. it's not not necessarily easy or pleasant but we have to remember that we are consciousness infinite consciousness consciousness incarnating in these little tiny bodies for a, a little speck of time each of us has this little tiny experience which is actually just goes comes and goes like that when you get to my age and i'm 65 and you know i might only have 30 years <laughs> left if i'm very lucky <laughs> it's nothing you know you realize as you get old older <laughs> you realize how how you know an individual life is not really what it's all about there's way more way more way more about, way more at stake and so mm. i think we have to overcome our fear of dying and our fear of of impermanence and uh, i think think the uh the Buddhist, you know, the um, you know, the Dalai Lama who meditates on his death every morning, and you know, where they make those sand mandalas and push them out, you know, destroy them with a, a flick, a flick of the yeah. paintbrush. Um, I think we have to realize that, that that on 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 the bigger picture, we we are going through a birth canal as a civilization, and I, I think think there's enormous enormous hope. So yeah, yes, I am I am frustrated, Jeffrey, like you are with. With the, you know, the Australian government and bureaucracy and our health ministers and the TGA and, you know, I go bloody hell, why? Are they, how can they be so, so dense? <laughs> and yet, yet, um, yeah, that denseness, that that immaturity, that that narrow-minded consciousness is not sustainable. It mm. truth is bubbling up, wisdom is bubbling up, awakening totally. is bubbling up. And, so to and, summarize um, what you've said tonight summarizing <laughs> if um if i was a farmer and i had 500 acres and i'm listening to the show and i could turn that 500 acres into growing hemp and i'm on the darling downs of of queensland and would I be going for industrial hemp? Would I be going for the fact that I want to get the seeds as an edible oil crop coming out of it? Or would I want to go for the paper and pulp aspect to it? Do I want to go for um, the medicine type of thing? Or do I want to go for the food? I mean, there's, there's so many derivatives of this plant. What, what would you suggest to a farmer who wants to take the punt and realise he doesn't have to fill it with... Um, that field with um, fertilizer and chemicals, you know. Yeah, I think um, well that in Australia at the moment um, you wouldn't be growing <coughs> medicine if you're on the Darling Downs and you're doing broadacre farming because um, well just to, just to mention that briefly, if you if you're growing it for medicine in Australia, you need to spend probably a million dollars on a high security system. You have to have uh, laser security around everything you have to be in an in an area where no one's going to see it uh you have to hire security guards <laughs> you know, oh it's like what's your is million that, dollars just right? to set up a cannabis medicine even if you're growing cbd which is non-psychoactive that's how prohibitive the cost is you know there are a few few bigger businesses which are getting into growing hemp but it's very you know cannabis legally but it's very hard for them um, to actually, I, I bought some shares in a couple of medical <laughs> marijuana companies, legal ones, but the shares went down over the last few years. <laughs> it's very, been very difficult for them. The black market um, in medicine, medicine, cannabis medicine, is way stronger than the legal market, you know, for CBD, cannabis, and THC cannabis. So, yeah, it's hard if you're going to do it legally. Um, so then, you, then you're left with fibre or seeds. And 
you can go either way. In Australia, the fiber industry is about the same as the seed industry. Um, and there's a woman in New Zealand who's, um, where they, they grow most of the seeds in, uh, sorry, not New Zealand, in Tasmania. They grow most of the seed crops in Tasmania at the moment, but there's also a possibility of once you've harvested the, the seed to then use the rest of the crop um, for, for the fiber. But that takes a bit more processing. And the, there is a woman in Tassie who's, who's working on that and, and has a business, I think it's called X Hemp. So her entire business is just using the rest of the, in, the seed crop. After they've harvested the seeds off, she uses the rest of it for legal products, which means that she's she's using the um, she's processing the the herd, which is the inner part of the stalk and and the fiber, and making um, products like animal bedding or or um, I think she's even making hempcrete out of the out of the uh, the the herd, the inner herd. So so um, yeah, that's that's the potential if you're growing it for seeds. You have you have that potential. To, to also use the crop for other things. Most seed producers in Australia, however, are just growing it for seed and the rest of the crop they can't use because it's still illegal to feed the rest of the crop to animals. You can't put cows in on the rest of the, you know, the plant matter. You're procuring the seed off. You think there's a huge amount of fodder there in the, you know, the, 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 the rich leaves and all that, which are very nutritious, but our silly laws don't allow cows even to come and eat them they're worried that the cows might pick up some <laughs> some some trace of marijuana from an industrial hemp crop so anyway it, it is very it, difficult say, so you, you either grow it for yeah. seeds or you grow it for fiber and the fiber um the fiber is mostly being used for hemp creep uh, so that does take some processing and there are um, more and more decorticating machines coming up around the place. I know there's one up at Tenterfield where the hemp I'm buying is, is being decorticated. That means that if you're growing it for fibre, you, you, you're growing a long, tall stalk, and there's a machine that separates the inner part of the stalk, which is called the herd, and that's what they make, make hempcrete out of, and then there's the fibre on the outside, which is, is what can be milled into clothing. Unfortunately, Australia um, is, is, is really behind in, in the processing of the, the fibre. So there's a lot of valuable, they call it bast fibre. The fibre of the, of the hemp crop, it, it, it's going to take quite a lot of um, processing for us to be able to get, get the machines like China does to process uh, the hemp in, into valuable fibre. So Unfortunately, we're not really using the fibre very much at, at this stage. Most of the in, industrial hemp that's been grown for fibre is using the inner part of the stalk, and that does require de decortication. But that is is still proving to be profitable. Farmers that are, you know, there's still farmers that are doing that and making making a profit out of it. Um, exactly how much profit, I don't know. It's a it's a beginning industry, so I, I, I think that. Yeah, like any 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 industry, it's it's sort of slowly slowly getting there. But overall, it is it is really being hampered by by our our laws. Because if the farmers, if they were able to, to to grow that fiber, as I've said before, if they were able to grow their fiber crop and then also um, procure medicine from the same crop, it would be a very profitable crop. As as some. Um, as the Canadian farmers can benefit from, but but nevertheless, there are Australians who who are doing it, and I think that th th they're very, you know, brave and bold Australians who who farmers, you know, who ha who have a vision and who can see that this is the right thing to do. It's the appropriate thing to do. It's it it, it it's a no brainer that that cannabis hemp, you know, is is a, a plant that should be supported and. Agri futures, like I say, agri futures, the Australian government's agricultural um, sort of supporting body. They're they're also very supportive of it and very very encouraging the farmers to to grow it. I I don't think there are subsidies at this stage. It'd be good if there were. Um, 
you know, it'd be great if the, the government just really got behind it and subsidized it for a little while to get these industries off the ground to, to, to help buy some decorticating machines to, you know, help help buy um, some MC processing machines to sort of support the industry in that way. But but even without that kind of subsidy, there is still, um, yeah, a, a growing industry. It's growing at about 17% per annum, the industrial hemp um, industry in Australia. So that's a pretty rapid growth, really, considering the restrictions that are happening. It's still growing, growing pretty steadily. So yeah, there's 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 a lot of hope, and and um, they're doing studies to show that um, cows can eat the stuff and not be damaged. That takes about I, th I think we're at, at about year five of a five year study going on <laughs> to try and prove that cows can eat it. In which case, it would be even you know more valuable for farmers who are growing hemp and cattle that they could they could then yeah procure. Uh, you know, feed feed the residue after they've harvested the uh, the fiber or the seeds to feed the rest of it to their cattle. So that, that's got cow manure that's, as well. So it's natural. Proven, yeah. Hmm? The cow yeah, manure so that, as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. you know, for us with Queensland, with um, you've got Queensland cotton, you've got Namoy cotton, um, cotton traders. These guys are up there in the Queensland and the northern New South Wales Namoy, you know just massive big cotton farms that are coming to the gins and stuff. It's just if some of those took the um, the bite and went for the hemp, just to reduce the water um, allocations that would then service the whole Murray, Darling Rivers all the way through New South Wales, Victoria into South Australia. From a national perspective, there's, um, there's a lot to be said for introducing the hemp in those areas, isn't it? Well, there sure is. I mean, as far as I understand, most of the cotton we're just shipping straight over to China for processing anyway. So, you know, the, the worst case scenario, if we just grew the hemp stalks and shipped it over to China for processing, that would be equally as good. And, um, you know, if, if not way better, because it, it does require a lot less of the chemicals that, as, as my documentary says, Dr. Kate Short um, says, cotton is basically a chemical industry. It, this takes a huge amount of chemicals to suppress the weeds, which hemp doesn't require. It doesn't require those that, that, that much herbicides because it, the canopy of the hemp leaves just blocks out the weeds naturally. And then, as far as pesticides, there might be some some pests that might get in. Uh, that's kind of inevitable. Inevitable yes. in Australia for a broadacre farm it might need some pesticide use, but but it's a way more robust plant. Well, I, I imagine I, I think it's a way more robust plant than cotton, as far as I have heard. So, so, so certainly, certainly way less, you know, weed weed killers and probably less pesticides required for hemp than cotton. So, and and, and uh, as far as water goes, it, it would need irrigation too, but but possibly less than cotton. I'm not a, not an expert on that, so mm. I could couldn't say for sure. Wow, that's amazing. Because, um, like, we are in the greatest change of history at this moment in time. You know, everything's moving, changing, and um, and we've all chosen to be here at this time to help waken up humanity and help each other. Um, and nature is the greatest healer of all, isn't it? And I think with all the different things that have gone on, more and more people are looking at the herbs, they're, they're looking at all different aspects of nature um and this finding the balance and the balance within eh? absolutely and and na na you know dare i say it but the drug companies have made their billions of dollars from looking at nature that's that's where they've got so many of their patents from is just from looking at the plant kingdom and mm. going down to south america and trying to patent things and plants that have been used for thousands of years naturally and I think we're realizing more and more ju just how much nature has to offer, has every, everything, everything mm. that is in nature. Well, and it. it, yeah. it's, I'm really glad to see a, you know, a, a growing awareness of, of natural medicines and natural products. And, and, you know, it's a very healthy part of our evolution right now. And, and our 
coupled together with our modern scientific analysis of natural medicines. I mean, when I was a kid, no one knew about turmeric. And now I think, you know, now, now the extract of turmeric mm. called curcumin, I, I find is by far the best anti-inflammatory if, if I've got a sore back if uh, or, or, an in, you know, in, in inflammation. And, and when I was a kid also, no one knew that, that cannabis was a great painkiller. If I get a sore back, I'll, I'll have a bit of cannabis oil that I make myself. I just dissolve cannabis and coconut oil mm. and it's just a natural product and it works so well and I don't have to go to a pharmacy or get a prescription. There's just so many, mm. yeah, the plant kingdom has so much to offer. And I think that the drug companies don't want us to know about that. They would rather not. rather we support their billion dollar profits and buy their products. But and stay sick. You know, I really don't think, I, I you know, I know modern science and modern medicine has done an, an enormous amount. I don't want to undercut their place in the, in the grand scheme of our health, but there's so much um, that we can just get from natural medicines um, in, in a way less toxic and less dangerous way than, than, um, and you don't get a list of, um, and you don't get a list of side effects, do you, with the plants <laughs> like you do on a box way less of medicine? Side <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's when you synthesize those plant compounds, when you synthesize them and extract them and, and then isolate them, that's when you're running into problems because the human body is not adapted to, to mm -hmm. you know, those synthetic substances that are then isolated. And the, the same they're finding with, with cannabis medicine. If they try to um, isolate or synthesize THC, for instance, that the main active ingredient in marijuana, they 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 realized, you know, a lot, what 30 years ago now that it had great medical use. So they tried to extract THC and sell it as a medicine, just THC, and it just didn't work. It just made people crazy. <laughs> so it didn't work. So there's now it's now commonly understood that whole spectrum can cannabis is going to be way more effective no matter what you're treating if you want you know if you want the non-psychoactive cbd which is the the other main cannabinoid that we've done research or know about it's still way more effective to to have cbd in a the it's called full spectrum cannabis like like, like you it, it's way more effective if you have it with all the other cannabinoids in there mm. as well. And there's about a hundred of them in the cannabis plant. I, mm. I'd like to add something. You haven't asked me this question, but while we're talking about, about medicine and cannabinoids, I, I'd just like to say that the reason that cannabis is so effective as a medicine is that it interacts with our own endocannabinoid system. And that was discovered by a an Israeli doctor called Raphael Machulam about Dr. Raphael Machulam about 20 years ago. He's really like the father of cannabis medicine. He's a beautiful man. He's now 90 years old. But he discovered it didn't make big headlines in the news, but he made one of the most significant medical discoveries of the last hundred years. And that is the discovery of the endocannabinoid system. And that is a system within our own bodies that cannabis relates to, but it is a system that, that also um, produces and interacts with our own cannabinoids that we make, our endogenous cannabinoids. So hu hu human beings actually produce cannabinoids. And the, interestingly enough, the, 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 elements that we need to produce those ca cannabinoids in our body are the essential fatty acids that are also found in hemp seeds and, and fish oil and flaxseed oil, like especially omega-3, 6 and 9 and the other essential fatty acids. So what the endocannabinoid system does is it regulates everything in our, in our entire bodies. It is one of the most essential, you know, systems of a healthy body and that's why we're realizing that the quality of the oils and the quality of the food we eat has such a fundamental effect on mm. on our overall health 
And then what they have also discovered is that the cannabis plant and the cannabinoids in the cannabis plant interact with the endocannabinoid receptors. And those receptors are in our, our brains. The, the receptors that the, 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 C, the, the endocannabinoid one receptors in our brain and sexual organs. And those, those ones um, lock on specifically well to THC, the cannabinoid THC, which is the psychoactive one. And that's why THC has such, a, such an effect on our brains being psychoactive and also on our sex organs. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone's ever realized that if you, um, if you have sex while you, after you've had cannabis, it's going to be a way enhanced experience. It can take people's sexuality to a whole new level. Mm. I know from personal experience, I'm sure many people do. So there's also a second cannabinoid system, um, which is uh, in the lymph glands. Um, it's the CB2 receptors, I call them. They're in the lymph glands um, all through the whole body, um, pretty well in every organ. And that interfaces with all the other cannabinoids in the cannabis plant being CBD and they've discovered about about 90 others at this point and it's it's a it's a a huge just beginning body of science because we're just beginning to learn about all these different cannabinoids and now there's a very rapidly evolving um, science and marketing going on, especially in the places where it's legal in the United States, where they're, they're learning about the cannabinoids. And then also, on top of that, different strains of cannabis have have different terpenes. They're the, they're the, um, the, the, the parts of the plant that make that beautiful aroma. And there's different terpenes also have different psychoactive effects as well. So we're looking at you know, maybe 120 different compounds at this point in the cannabis mm -hmm. plant that all have potential medicinal use for almost every kind of ailment because it interfaces, they interface with the endocannabinoid system that regulates every system in our body. So there's never been, um, yeah, there's never been a plant <laughs> that yeah, could have it's... potentially so many different ways of helping humanity as in a medical way it's never you know there's no, there's nothing else that comes near it in, in in its medical use and the other thing is it's completely non-toxic you know compared to other other medicines that are in use today cannabis because of its natural um affinity and compatibility with our endocannabinoid system it's it's very compatible with our bodies you you, you cannot have too much cannabis you know that that would be lethal or harmful to to our our biology sure sure you can have too much thc and you can feel nauseous and vomit and feel horrible <laughs> and some people even feel like they're dying if they have too much by mistake but by the next day it's it's not a you know you might be tired the next day and by the third day it's fine it's actually not even at such huge high doses, it's 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 benign. It's benign. So, I think think for that reason, there's just a huge, you know, huge potential. The the biggest challenge is 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 getting money for the research because the drug companies don't have any interest in it, even yeah, in the places so. where it's legal. <laughs> all the big all the big money that's going into into researching comes from the drug companies, and they're that you know we know they have profits of, of billions of dollars literally billions of dollars every year they have no interest in supporting research into cannabis because at the end of the day if they prove that cannabis works people can just grow their own strains of cannabis at home they makes mm. the drug companies redundant and that's what's that's what is happening in the places where it's where it's being legalized and, and mm. you know like I, I don't want the dr drug companies to be redundant because I, I'm sure there's something that they, you know, I'm sure there's a part that they could play, but I think that their, their, their part is, is unnecessarily yeah. uh, big at this point. <laughs> so, totally. So I think, totally. I think to get things, to get things back into balance um, and the balance is inevitable. It's inevitable as we wake up, we will, will 
inevitably as a species if we are going to keep evolving and growing and being sustainable which is we have to be sustainable if we're going to keep living on this planet then then we will will evolve to, to understand that just working with plants uh and you know cannabis in in particular and all the other plants just working naturally with plants is is the way for us to achieve our optimum optimum mm. health and optimum success as a species mm. Mm. well amazing <laughs> Uh, I've learned so much from listening to you and your sharing and um, yeah, it's been really enlightening. So um, um, amazing that Colorado are setting the scene for us to follow, eh? Amazing. Yeah, really, really amazing. Mm. Go, get well, on you, Colorado. <laughs> yeah, yeah, gosh. Yeah. So I better go you know, have a holiday over there and see what, yeah, yeah. see what natural medicines they've got in the local coffee shop. Mm. <laughs> yeah no it's, it's amazing right well that for me that that was absolutely fascinating um thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom and knowledge um you know and i know most of our listeners would have learned a lot more from you than you know the average you know, read about different things and and what have you so um yeah thank you for your sharing thank you andrina you're welcome thank you jeffrey thank you so yeah very good very good love it Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks.